It's time to do this, Chris. All right, I, I need to, there we go. Hey everybody, this is Matt and we're at Texas Toast Guitars. Thanks for joining us for episode one of our um, live guitar building and repair Q&A. Uh, this is the only live Q&A with, uh, with Chris and myself where we answer your questions uh, about guitar building and we're actual guitar builders. So that's a very cool thing. So thank you guys for tuning in. I think it's going to be uh, a lot of fun. And this is something that we're going to do every Thursday at five mountain time. So just remember what time it is now. We're gonna do that every Thursday for the rest of the year, <clears throat> except for the first Thursday of every month. And I think we're gonna take Thanksgiving off, but all the other Thursdays, um, uh, we're not gonna we're, we're gonna have this show Chris why are we not doing it on the first Thursday of every month because on the first Thursday of every month we have online training classes that's right so you can uh, you can sign up and uh, check out the online training classes uh, the next one is fretwork and uh, that's installation leveling dressing uh, polishing grinding etc etc and uh, December 17th is <clears throat> guitar next and we're going to talk about all that stuff but i'd like to thank our sponsors for helping us make this show happen flipside music the great american guitar store if you're ever in the denver area check those guys out mike learn airbrush and mike learn guitars as you guys know we're buddies with mike learn he's a good friend of ours and uh, we want to support him because he supports us bitterroot guitars uh our sponsor for a long long time um some of you guys have told me that the Bitterroot code is or isn't working. I just got off the phone with Cheryl like an hour ago. If you use code TXTOAST at checkout, you get 15% off everything in your shopping cart. So thank you to Bitterroot Guitars. Simtech Coatings, uh, we're going to talk a lot about Simtech Coatings tonight. Um, we use their sanding sealer and there's talk of perhaps using some UV cure stuff that Simtech makes. Also, I'd like to thank our uh, sponsor, Guitar Wood Experts. Without them, we wouldn't have all the neat stuff to make guitars out of. So, Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. You had something that you wanted to say. Um, you, had a, you had a slogan. Oh, yeah. Um, this is the only show from wood selection to string selection. That's and right. everything that, I in like between. That. That's a cool one. I like that. <laughs> so, guys, if you have any questions about wood selection or string selection or anything else guitar related that goes from in the middle of those two things please let us know there's a bunch of uh guitar you know live q a things um where they talk about like pedals and stuff we're, we're not pedal guys so uh we're not amp guys we're guitar builders so please direct all your guitar building questions to us now a couple of things um there's a lot of chatter in the uh in the, in the side thing that's super cool i'm glad that you guys are, are here if you have a question for Chris and I, please start it out with the question mark symbol, and uh, we will know that you have a question for us. Yes, so. or several question marks. Works even better. That works the best. Because then I can really see it. Do we have any yet so yes, far? Yes, we do. All right. Are we ready to start? Let's jump right in. All right. Just Ron wants to know, uh, wrap bridge mounting holes. That's the question? No. Okay. High E mount center at scale length and low E about an eighth inch further back. Okay, for gotcha. Intonation. So we're talking about mounting bridges and setting it for intonation. So, but he also said wrap bridge. Yes. Okay, so Ron, I'm sure that you know that if you're using a tunomatic um, and you, you, <clears throat> you're at the, at the scale point, you want the low E side to be back about an eighth of an inch. That's a great rule of thumb. For wraparound bridges, I generally don't put any angle on them. Um, the uh, the Golden Age wraparound bridge that we've been using from Stuart McDonald is uh, has plenty of adjustment to accommodate that extra tweak. So I center the I center the saddles um, in the in their grooves, and then I center that on the uh, the scale measurement. Great. Okay. There you go. Yeah. And that. Um... So really, the only bridge that we typically angle is a tunomatic. Everything else is yeah. straight. Yeah. Now, what about what about a tunomatic with rollers? Do you angle those? Um, I generally don't. I don't. No. I mean, I might cheat it a little bit, but I want the, I want the strings to go over the rollers. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, strings move over the rollers. It it barely rolls. Yeah. But 
Yeah. Yeah. So so if you're replacing a an existing bridge with a roller, it's probably fine. Yeah. But if you're mounting a new one, I yeah make them straight. Yeah. And I might even cheat it a little bit. Well, I'd put them. I'd put the adjustments in the middle and then make sure that I can go back far enough. I might actually cheat it a little bit. It depends on back. the bridge. Yeah. yeah. Make sure yeah. you guys if you're if Show you're. Enough. If you're building a guitar and you don't know what the bridge you're going to be using is, you're making an error. Find out, figure out what bridge you're going to use, and 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 build the guitar around that. That way, you don't have any any you know tricky issues later on. What else we got? Um. <laughs> One of the things about about anything that I do, as you guys know, is I don't like to have any dead air, and I like to have. I want to be able to make sure that you guys can hear me. And that's what we're going to do on these Thursday shows. There's going to be lots of uh, Matt screaming at the camera and um, no dead air at all because I hate it when that happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, issue with pin router tear out when doing neck body outline. Hmm, okay. Who wants to, who's got uh, that? JJ from SC. JJ from SC is having some pin router issues with... Um, you know, the pin router is a fantastic tool, and it's one that I rarely, if ever, use for perimeter of the guitar routing or necks. Um, the, the, the problem that you have with the pin router is you're limited to the size of the, of the bit. Generally, like the biggest bit that I'll use on our, our pin router mm, for, for pattern work is a half inch. And the problem with a half inch bit is it's just not big enough in diameter to to fully eliminate tear out now you can um you can angle you can get the spiral cut bits and that helps a lot you can take very very light passes that helps a little um but yeah the the pin router is is better than a router table or a handheld router but if you're using a half inch cutter not by much. Uh, the pin router is is kind of kind of tricky. Um, that's why we use a shaper to do all of our our perimeter work. But um, yeah, the, so the the hot setup. If you're having trouble, you know some woods, of course, are going to be different than others. Um, so for example, bird's eye maple, notorious chipper outerer. Mm -hmm. um, the the hot setup is to cut that as close as you can with whatever cutting tools you're using, bandsaw, router, something like that. Uh, and then sand to to final to final size. That's a, a good rule of thumb that an expert woodworker taught me many many years ago. Um, when thicknessing stock, is get it within a sixteenth with the planer, joiner, the blade tools, and then a, a braid to final thickness on the drum sander. So same idea. If you're having a lot of trouble with that, um, what do you do, Chris? Pin, we haven't pin routed perimeter cuts for years correct just it, it's just it's because you can step it down like a little tiny bit at a time but you're never going to get rid of all that tear out because the blood the bits just aren't big enough yeah diameter wise yeah okay all right ready to move on yes uh is ash the only wood that you guys use on the t-style guitars on daily drivers uh the ash is the preferred wood for daily drivers but we will use anything that you guys want so um, the Daily Driver is, uh, it's a, a very customizable guitar. Yeah. Um, so the, the base model is, is Ash with the base model bridge and the base model neck and the base model yada yada. Um, but you can add pickups, you can add veneers, you can add tops, you can add binding, you can add fabric, you can add, you know... Uh, the sky's the limit on the daily driver, and I don't know why that is, but it's fun. Yeah, I think the reason that the daily driver, why we usually use ash, is because ash looks good with our durable thin finish. Oh, that's it's right. It's an easy wood to get to dye uh, a, a color uh, evenly, and the the open grain looks really good with the durable thin finish. And, That's right, because we, we actually don't. spray dye directly onto the... It's the one time we spray dye directly onto the wood rather than yeah. use a, a, a translucent color mm -hmm. on top of sealer. Yeah, and the Daily Driver, as the name implies, is the uh, is designed to be a more affordable guitar than, than mm -hmm. some of the other crazy things that we do so that's yeah why they're usually ash but yeah if you guys want a daily driver or any of our guitars in in woods that are you know you 
the, the, the thing to remember is all of this stuff is, um, uh, is, is based on what you want. So people ask me all the time, what are your neck profiles? Well, they're, they're, all of our necks are built to order. So yeah. they're, they're, they're whatever you want. Good. Hope that answers that question. Um, what, Jason Trail wants to know, would you ever consider having a person come in to do a build class on a, as a solo student? As a matter of fact, Jason, we have our good friend Andrew St. Pierre coming to join us uh, the, the first week of December. He has rented the shop and rented Chris and I to help him build a very, very special guitar. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I heard Matt say, I basically, I got sold yesterday. <laughs> I heard the phrase, and you get, yeah, you get to have Chris for 40 hours. Yeah. And I was like... Hey. Now, 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 this is Jason. One of the things that you, boy, this is not the the world's most affordable way to do this. Okay. No. Um. So if you if you are interested in doing that, um, please send me an email, and and let's talk about uh what that is going to what the cost for that would be and and what it is that you want to make too. Um, and remember, a week is not very long. And, and, and I, I, I think what happens is people go, I want to build a exact replica of a 1959 Les Paul, in every, exact in every way. And I want to do it in a week, and I've, I've got no or very little guitar building experience. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, that Jason wants to do that or has little or no but I get that a lot. So um, uh, building a Les Paul is, you know, if you were building, <clears throat> if somebody said, I want to rent the shop for a week and I want to build an exact replica of a 59 Les Paul minus the finish, I think that it would be uh, very comparable with a Gibson historic reissue guitar in terms of price when it was all said and done. So. But send me an email if that's something that you're if, that you're interested in doing, and let's talk about it. All right, back to bridges. Okay. For a hardtail bridge, do you compensate for the saddles? I don't know what that means. I think yes, you do. Do you um, compensate the bridge location? Yeah. So so typically, if you're trying to locate a bridge, I'll usually put the saddles in um, about their, the middle of their adjustment. Yeah. And then go from there and then measure back if it's 25 and a half inch scale, go to 25 and a half and mark a line there, knowing that that low E is going to be back, you know, 25 and, and uh, five eighths or something like that. Yeah. So make sure that you have enough that it'll go back that way. And the low or the high E string, then will be a little bit in front of that 25 and a half inch mark. It'll be 25 and three eighths. And also remember, if you're using a, a an individual saddle or or compensated two string saddle that goes through the body, you can get those saddles so far back that it impedes. Yeah. Uh, or, or or sometimes sometimes the individual saddles, um, uh, there's a hole through the bridge and a hole through the saddle that's an elongated thing. You have to kind of hedge your bets for that so that you don't have to move the saddle all the way back and, and basically completely cover up that hole through the through the bridge and through the body going to the string string mounting yep uh tom l wants to know what's hey, the tom. best way to bind a completed neck frets removed of course bearing doesn't seem like it would ride correctly mm. on a thinner neck yeah it doesn't want to do that uh i don't know that there's a great way to do that um if you wanted to use your um your your bit you would need to jig up something that um would allow you know so for example you could build up a faux fretboard that you could you could use at you could basically route it backward of what you would normally do so if you had a, a saddle that the neck sat in with the frets removed fretboard side down in a um a, a radius block slash saddle and you could affix that to that then you could run your your bearing along the saddle that would be a way to do it uh the other the other way to do that is is it rebinding or binding 
Was it re? Uh, I think it was binding. Yeah. The other the other way is a lot less uh, a lot less powered, and that's files and the old school score mark and and the old school binding channel cutter, which I think I think Stumac has those. You can still buy those. That that's a way to go too. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. What is the best way to find correct neck pocket depth on a guitar with a Tele style bridge? Well, uh, it's going to depend on, you know the height of your bridge and you know the height of the thickness of your bridge plate, you know the height of your saddles. Uh, so if you imagine you've got X is the height of the bridge plate and Y is the height of the saddles, you know what X plus Y is, that's a minimum uh, size. You've got some adjustable uh, space in there that's kind of a, uh, of a, of a Z, if you will, if, you're, if we're using letters. Um, so you, uh, you'll need to also know how tall your fretboard is. So sometimes we make fretboards that are so thick that we have to make the neck pocket deeper than the standard Fender 5 8 neck pocket. Um, they just won't, won't quite go with, with, a, um, with a regular Fender neck pocket. And the downside to that is if you've got a pick guard, you might have so much, uh, so much neck meat that it, it, it presses against the pick guard, right, Chris? Correct. So what you would need to do is, is, is figure out how tall your neck is. You want to be generally like 900 thousandths to an inch is a good place for your necks to be. That's kind of what fenders usually are. Um, Three-quarter inch neck with a quarter inch fretboard, and then radius takes a little bit of that off. Um, you want your uh, a neck pocket standard fender is about five eighths deep. You want about a half inch from the top of the frets to the top of the. If you put a straight edge on the top of your fretboard and measure at the twenty five, well, on a, it's it's going to be flat. So measure measure from the top of your frets to the top of your body. You want about a half of an inch, generally speaking. Now, um, people have asked me this. This has come up a lot in the last couple of weeks. Uh, why do I angle things? So if you're having some trouble with, you know, you've got an extra thick fretboard, you could always angle or shim the neck pocket to give you a little more, a uh, little more height at the 25 and a half inch uh, scale location. Does that, does that make sense? Does that, I know I can't actually ask the person who had, but did that. Yes, did, I think so. While I was explaining it to you, were you like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, man? that, well, no, I did not say that. Okay. Um, how would you copy a favorite neck profile? Hmm. Okay, that's a great question. How would we copy a, a favorite neck profile? Now, I have never copied my favorite neck profile because I don't have one. However, the trickiest neck profile I have ever had to copy was far and away the Newman, uh, the Newman neck, which was a, a guitar that we built for Newman Guitars that was about a year ago. Do you remember? Yeah, that was about a year ago. It was here. Yeah, yeah that's right. Um, and they have a a really kooky neck. It's um, it's a C shape neck from the twelfth fret, or I'm sorry, from the nut to the eighth fret, and then it becomes an asymmetrical V from the eighth fret all the way to the heel, and it goes from like eight hundred thousandths at the first fret to almost a full inch at the 12th fret. So what I had to do there was measure every single spot on the neck that I could with a, with a set of calipers. So I got my handy calipers here and I measured as close as I could. And I, what I always do is I, I take my neck blank and I write on the, on the fretboard side what it needs to be at that position. So at the first fret on the Newman, it was 800 thousandths. So I would write 800 thousandths on the first fret and go all the way down and figure out to like where my heel is, etc. And then, um, then I would shape until I, you know, had, had the, the thickness was right. And then I would work on the, um, on the profile. And, um, we have a profile gauge jig kind of, what do they call those? Do you know what, what those are called? Um, it's a, yeah, it's a profiling profiling something they sell them you can guide. buy them at home depot yeah. guide yeah yeah um the one that i use is is i think i got it at harbor freight like 
a decade ago. And, and it, still, it still works okay. And it, it'll give you, like, what the arc looks like. You know, you put it on there, and it, it kind of moves some pins around, and, and it helps you gauge and find what it needs to be. And then you can go from one to the other. Now, if you don't have a neck, like, for example, if you're using the Fender Custom Shop uh, catalog and all of the, which is a great resource, by the way. If you are looking at that, you can, um, you can go in and get an idea of, you know, thicknesses at the first and 12th fret and profiles at the first and 12th fret. And they just sort of go all the way down from there. Yeah. So that's a great, great resource. Good. Uh, Jay Kelly wants to know, does Texas Toast have an original model body style of its own? Uh, Jay? Yes. Yes, Jay, we do. It's called the Challenger, and there's a lot of them coming very, very soon. You can look on our website in the Gallery of Guitars and uh, the the Challenger. It's a single cut set neck model. Um, uh, you know who has the coolest one? Uh, well, there's a lot of yeah. Cool there's ones, a lot of cool. Devin ones. has one of the coolest ones <laughs> ever. Um, he actually that was supposed to be my guitar. He bought that. He bought that though. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we make we make a lot of guitars for people, and they want what they want. So yeah. we end up making a lot of guitars that are other people's designs. But we do have we have a couple different challengers too, a couple different sizes and styles and stuff like that. Yeah, that's true. So there you go. Uh, e. R. Kelly wants to know. Oh, sorry, not E. R. Kelly. E. R. Webster wants to know. Ever had the buffer snatch a body out of your hands? More times How than did I care you to deal admit. with the damage. Okay, the, the time it happened to me, um, I, I held an online contest and gave the body away. That's, I think, the best repair ever. Yeah, yeah, is, not repair. Damn it. it. Here, yeah. take it. Um, I did something similar. Uh, I had the body. It was all buffed and ready to be assembled. And I thought, well, I'll take it over the buffer one more time and just give it a quick little, little shine up. And it grabbed the body and it flung it to the floor and put a big dent in it. And I had to just go back and repaint it. And was yours, it all was yours and, on and video? It. No, mine was not on video. Yours was. And you can actually watch the video. Yeah, you can see it's the Texas Toast sizzle reel. And I don't know what at what you know number it is. But in our sizzle reel, the, 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 um, the buffer just yanks a guitar right out of my hand. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, I don't see that I'm doing it. Like I wasn't, it just whip it just took it right out of my hands yeah. and i can't explain why we have since padded our buffer a little bit to try and, and and mitigate some of that but and we've also slowed the the buffing wheels down mm -hmm. uh quite a bit too yeah 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 and i i have a feeling that uh he's asking that question i i hope you're for, not for asking that question not, for the reason but, that i uh, think you might be yeah yeah, yeah. uh i've dropped i i dropped one thing one time and it hit my shoe and didn't damage anything on the thing it was a neck oh, okay to a famous guitar um but anyway really? yeah okay uh so it might not be the worst idea to put some sort of padding underneath the buffer if you're yeah. worried about it yeah or yeah. or if your buffer is is whipping bodies out of your paws a lot maybe slow slow down the see if you can slow down the um uh the RPM of the actual buffers. And remember too, that you've got, you can decrease the size of your wheels. Some of those, some of the buffing wheels that, that we started with early were three inches bigger than, than the buffs that we have now. Yeah. Uh, because remember, if you've got your, your rotations per minute stay the same, but your speed at the outside is, is different. So yeah. anyway. Yep. Uh, any advice you would give to someone with crippling self-doubt on how to start guitar building? Uh, okay. He doesn't want to spend a lot of money uh, and then find out that he just can't do it. Okay. Well, uh, normally what I would say would be to attend one of our uh, week-long classes. But if you don't want to spend, you know, you don't want to shell out cash right away, I understand that. Uh, you, you need to dip your feet in. So the easiest thing to do would be um, build a body. That's far and away the easiest thing to do. You could, you could build a body with uh, a blank from Guitar Wood Experts. Um, call Dan and have him send you a blank, you know, thickness and ready to go. <clears throat> you could be, 
Oh, let's see. You're gonna need to you're gonna need to either make or or buy some templates. Even if it's just for pickup cavities in a neck pocket, you're gonna need to have that stuff. You need to, you can make it. It's easier to buy it, and it might be cheaper in the long run to buy it. Um, you will you can fiddle around with chisels and and hammers and hand tools, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the easy way to do it is with the router. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you can build a guitar standing on your head, and there's probably guys who you know are really really great with hand tools who can do all of that stuff with hand tools. But if you're if you're not well versed at how to operate a hand tool, um, you will be you will be money ahead to buy the cheapest router that's a full size router that they have at a home center near you. Don't get a laminate trimmer. Get a full size router, and they're like fifty to seventy five dollars. And get a bearing pattern cutting bit, um, maybe a couple of them, $20. You'll need a something to, to yeah, so I, yeah, I, what, what, what would you do, Chris? If, if, would, would you, you know, we could, we could actually help a little bit with that. We could, we could do all of the hard stuff. Mm-hmm. We could uh, we could send somebody a, a a blank that was routed or Warmoth actually has these too, um, a blank that's ready to go with a neck pocket and pickup pockets and you cut out the body and you sand it and that's probably that's the easy that's the best way to start. Sure, it's the least amount of tool. Okay, so I, I let me back up. You can buy a router and you can buy all this stuff. It's neat and. It's not ever going to go bad, so uh -huh. you can you can work with it. Um, but the easiest, cheapest, fastest way to do it is build a body using uh, a, a kit from somewhere. Not a kit from China. I guys, I can't stress enough that the kits from China. I'm surprised at how much they don't suck. But I wouldn't say go out and grab one of those, and that's your dipping your toe into guitar building. I think you're dipping your toe into guitar building and guitar finishing and guitar repair with an $80 kit from China. Um, they're, they're fun, but they're not the easy way to do it, even though it looks like it is. The easy way to do it is go to someone that will sell you a blank with a neck pocket and pickups and you, you do the, you make it look like a guitar. Okay, cool. There you go. I'd say, you you gotta you gotta kind of just go for it and know that yeah. you're gonna you're gonna probably make a few mistakes and and that's okay it's part of the learning process I wouldn't spend a ton on on really expensive wood but I yeah. would I would even maybe if I was really really concerned about being able to do it I would buy a set of templates and make another set of templates and learn that's how great, to do it yeah. on MDF before I did it on real wood. And then, and then once you figure out, oh, it's really not that hard. It's just a learning how to use a tool. Then you could move on to to wood. And that's I wouldn't... that's actually the, the that's a great way to go, Chris. Okay. I I like that idea the best, actually. And uh, buy yeah. a set of templates and make another set of templates off of that. That will give you the the most. You, you'll 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 do that anyway. Mm -hmm. You'll learn how to use the router, and you'll have a set of templates that that are good. Yeah, yeah, and. Yeah, and, and you can do it. If you wanted to spend as much as you would spend on a new guitar and get the experience and go home with something cool, I would recommend one of our five-day classes. Um, we have one five-day class every single month except December. Um, the next one is in October 17th. It's uh, our 250 Build a Classic Telly. That's the, that's the number scheme that we have. Uh, it's like fifteen fifty to come out, and you spend in a whole week with us. You get to hang out with us and a bunch of other guys, and you build a guitar. You go home with a fully operational guitar when it's all done. And they're so cool. Everybody does this. They go home with the guitar, and they um, their wife has a dinner party or something, and they're like, hey, Matt, what'd you do last week? And they're like, wait, then they run and get their guitar and show it to everybody, and it's more than just a conversation piece it's it's something that is fun and you'll be able to talk about and remember 
for forever. So like I say, the next one is October 17th. That's our Build a Classic Telly. Um, I'm sorry, October 17th, Build a Classic Telly. November 16th is um, Build a Classic Strat. Uh, those are all week-long classes. And then the next one after that is if you're if you're if you're suffering from crippling self doubt, I wouldn't recommend this one. But it's January 18th, and that is our next level class. It's build um, build a set neck guitar, and this is what you will build at that class. So anyway, yep, cool. Yep. Ready? I'm ready. Uh, Andy the Saint. Hey Andy. Well, first of all, Doug Cook says uh, thoughts on tonal qualities of Black Leary. Okay, uh, oh, let, let's actually, let's touch on okay. that. Uh, I think that Poplar is wildly underrated as a tone would, um, and so do a lot of, of guitar companies. Um, there, are, there are wood snobs that will say this is absolutely false, but I don't see any, any negative to using, to using Poplar as, as, a, as a guitar building wood. Correct, and I, uh, the reason that we started calling Poplar... Uh, Leary is because it's it's genus is Lyrodendrum or mm -hmm. something like that, and uh, we like the, the the white limba black limba thing, and so yeah, purple streaked or darker streaked poplar became, became black Leary, black yeah. Leary, just as a way to not say it's poplar because there are people that don't think poplar is much of a wood. Yeah, but I I it machines great, it's easy to paint, um, it's you know it's, it's Gibson plentiful. Fender Jackson Charvel. Insert name of, of guitar yeah, company here. Yeah. They have all used Poplar. Yeah, so. and I like it. I like it as much, or I actually like it better than Alder. And I think Alder is like the number one, mm -hmm. you know, kind of wood. That and mahogany for for building guitars. If I, yeah, if I if I had but to choose had between, to, yeah. it was either it, I, there was no more ash. I would say it's Poplar all day long. Yeah, I would too. The only the only downside is the the the, the green and mm -hmm. the, the dark streaks. Yep. But sometimes you can find a really nice looking piece. Sure. So, so there you go. Andy the Saint wants to know, uh, do you guys have an opinion as to which is better, um, truss rods installed from the back or from the front, both from a construction and a structural viewpoint? I'm going to say I err on the side of truss rods installed with a fretboard on top. So installed and then... In, in two piece neck, if you will. So I guess what he means by well, I, install from the top is is not a no, I think not a. I think he's talking heel heel adjust or head adjust. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about both. Okay. So the way that I like to build necks is, I like to uh, not have the fretboard be the same piece of wood as the back of the neck. So um, whether it's it's a Fender style neck or a Gibson style neck. Uh, truss rod goes in, fretboard goes on. That's how I like to do it. Now, the Fender Skunk Stripe was popular, but I don't think even Fender uses. I, I've seen Skunk Stripe necks with fretboards that go on afterwards, mm -hmm. and I don't, I think they just sort of do it because people want to see that stripe. Yeah, I think so too. Now let's talk about heel adjust versus headstock adjust. What say you, Chris? Uh, what do I prefer? Yeah. Um, I used to be a total vintage snob, mm -hmm. and I thought that it looked better as a heel adjust. Mm -hmm. um, I've since come around to the idea that it is so much easier to adjust it when it's located on the, the headstock. The nice thing about having a headstock with no adjustment, Dealy, is you've got a lot of real estate for the logo. Yeah. And that's why we used heel adjust for a long, long time. Now, let me ask you a different way. What if you had a guitar with a Floyd and an angled headstock? Where would you want the truss rod to go then? This is a trick question. So uh, angled headstock. So let's say you had angled headstock, uh -huh. Floyd Rose locking nut, uh -huh. um, access at the headstock or access at the heel? I would like to have a uh, spoke wheel at the heel. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so Andrew, um, if that's what you're asking is where you like to have the truss rod access, um, it depends on the rod. The, the spoke wheel is super cool, um, especially if you have a Floyd, because there's so much stuff happening right here mm -hmm. that you have to basically disassemble the guitar a little bit to adjust the truss rod. What, who has the coolest spoke wheel of all time, Chris? 
Uh, I think uh, Stu Lippa has the coolest spoke wheel of all time. No, what manufacturer has the slickest spoke wheel ever in the history of guitars? What manufacturer? Yeah. Uh, well, I think Yamaha's is the coolest. How does that work? It actually goes through the body. It's got a it's got a hole in the body. It's got a square hole here, and then it's got uh, access for the truss rod there and they cover it up with a little uh, metal plate. So yeah, you remove what looks like the neck plate. Yeah. And actually what you have then is you have access to the truss rod. Yeah. And it, it's like right here. It's, it's really neat. It's pretty neat. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you can actually get to it. It's a bolt on neck. You, you have the, the cool looking headstock, but you mm -hmm. can't see a truss rod yeah. anywhere. It's yeah. pretty neat. That's one of my favorite Yeah, things to do. I, I've never built a guitar. I, we've talked about building a neck like that but we've never done it we haven't we haven't figured out the best way to do it yeah um, Andrew um, if you're asking on the guitar that you and I and Chris are going to be making I would go headstock adjustment on that one yeah so do you think there's a difference between um, or a difference in how the the rod reacts with the neck based on position you you will need to adjust your the size of your rod if you want them to work exactly the same. But in the grand scheme of things, I wouldn't sweat that. If your neck's built properly, you you won't. If, if your neck's built properly and the truss rod is the correct length, it should be like, it should be about the same distance either yeah. way. The thing to remember is that if you're down here where the heel is, this isn't gonna do any, this isn't gonna move. Right. So yeah. Um, I've seen some truss rods that, that are heel adjust that have a long, long, like three inch long adjustment rod and the actual action of the rod starts is, is in is in this neighborhood. And you just adjust the the rod and it, it like I say it, it it's the full length of the heel. So Yeah. That's a good way to go. Okay. Um Doug Santanello wants to know hey, will Doug? you be producing some solid challengers with that German carb like the uh the hater the hater maker, the sex, the electric sex machine. Yeah, I, Chris and I are actually talking about how we want to do a carb top challenger because we want to do one. Um, and but the carb is going to be something that I, I fear we're going to butt heads on that. Uh, well, you might not. We, we've talked a little about it. Uh, yeah, we've done some German carb, traditional German carb uh, challengers in the past, and I, I like the way they look on the upper bout and i'm not a fan of how they look on the lower bout mm. i don't so it works well on on like a Moserite, but i don't necessarily like it on our guitar so one of the, i think we're not going to butt heads as much as you think one of the issues with a with a uh sorry chris with a with a german carb right here is it is it interferes with this pickup and so we we need to figure out something to do there i you had one actually you had two guitars that had coves and one had a full German carb, and they were both Challenger shapes. Very cool instruments. Um, so yeah, Doug, we might we might actually do something like that sooner rather than later. Good. Uh, Bob quickly wanted to know Bob, if we were going to do a uh, uh, Eddie Van Halen tribute guitar. I actually talked with Chris about that. You did yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's a bummer that Eddie Van Halen is gone. Fortunately. We have lots and lots and lots of awesome songs, great music that we can still listen to. And, and so, yeah, um, we're probably going to do a little bit more talk about uh, uh, Van Halen on Sunday during the live stream. But let's get back to, to Bob's question. Um, I, think, I think that um, I, I don't know if it would be tacky or not for us to do a challenger body with the classic Eddie Van Halen stripe red white and black I, I i think that might be neat but i think people might think it's tacky yeah you know what i mean like like, like, like it's not a cash in like we're trying to cash in yeah um and i also think that it should probably have a floyd um one of bob do me a favor and send me an email bob later on about this look up eddie van halen paul reed smith there's two pictures one is the actual guitar that was built by paul reed smith for eddie van halen um, and it's not, it's not much to look at. The other one is a guitar that I think somebody just made and it's a Paul Reed Smith, but it's got all the Eddie Van Halen, like beat up 
extra pickups that don't have anything in them and it's got the stripes and it's all worn and it's really really neat um it's a fun story to kind of deep dive into i i i urge you to look that up because it's a fun thing and i i when i heard uh you say are we going to build a, a eddie van halen tribute thing i i immediately clicked on that because that was my thought was to make a challenger with stripes and a floyd and a bunch of hogged out cavities that don't go to anything and 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 make something like that but i don't know i'm not sure what we're gonna do uh thoughts on a pine neck i i do not think that pine is the hot setup for a guitar neck i don't think so either um now what do you think about pine for what did they say pine for a guitar neck or pine yes. for a neck um because it just says thoughts on a pine neck. Okay, so thought. Oh, how about this? Uh, would you make if if it was your if you had your druthers? Would you make a strat neck out of pine? No, me neither. If you had your druther, would you make a ukulele neck out of pine? Uh, I might. Why not? Yeah, because it's short and there's not a lot of yeah. tension. Yeah. What on about it. like a, a a cigar box neck out of pine? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think you'd be hard pressed to to find. A piece of pine that you would actually want to make a guitar neck out of. Mm -hmm. I don't think pine is that kind of wood at this point anymore. What's and I the? Think, I think years ago you could probably get a chunk of pine that, yeah. that you might want to use for that. I don't know what the payoff is either for using pine. Other I do. Than saying you you, <laughs> yeah. you made a neck out of pine. You got a quarter sawn pine neck just like uh, Bill uh, Kirchen. Yeah. Yeah. So what is what we we actually have some some drawings of that neck. And some some specs on string height. Yeah, it's it's, it's no truss rod. Correct. Uh, and it's it's a gigantic neck. It's over an inch. It's like one point one okay. inches thick at the first fret, which is titanic. Yeah. It would it would feel like a baseball bat. Yeah. Um, and, and his action is super his, high too. Right? Well, and the the relief on the neck because it doesn't have any any truss rod is, yeah, it's it's bowed. Okay. <laughs> How would you make a neck? Okay, uh, let me ask you this: How would you make a neck out of pine that was structurally stable? Uh, you'd have to use a, a good truss rod, and I'd put carbon fiber or steel rods in it as well. Yeah, I would say if you if you reinforce the crap out of it so that the actual uh, structure of the neck was the reinforcement, and the pine was just the hand filling stuff, mm -hmm. then then okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have a great big aluminum chassis that is covered with a pine veneer. But, yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's basically, yeah. yeah. You, 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 you make a maple neck mm -hmm. and then you cut off <laughs> yeah. and add pine to the. Yeah. 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 Um, but, yeah, I don't, I don't see any real payback for, for a pine neck. Other than it's cool to say you have a pine neck, which. I, and yeah. that's, that's fine if that's what you want to do. Yeah. 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 But you didn't ask me. Do I, you asked me what I thought of it, so. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there you go. Um, uh, do you guys feel that woods with a higher density are less susceptible to weather and temperature changes? Uh, boy, you know, volume, density, and mass are tricky. Okay. Uh, density is, is not necessarily weight. Or is it? What mass may not be weight. I think density might, in fact, be weight. So, what's the, the densest woods that we use are probably the really oily, not rosewood, ebony and maple are probably the densest woods that we use regularly. Um, when you go by ebony, you will see that it is waxed on both ends of the um, uh, on both ends of the of the wood, where the end grain actually is the most like a straw. Uh, so if you imagine each grain piece is a little tiny uh, highway for water and nutrients and stuff to move through the tree, or however that works. Um, and ebony is so expensive that they wax those ends. Um, so I don't think that the denser the wood, the less susceptible it is to 
moisture, humidity, stresses in the lumber, I think um, you have to really trust your wood supplier. Um, and uh, maple is... Maple is easier to work than ebony, and it's certainly quite a bit less money. Um, if, if you're looking for something, I think the drier the wood is and the less stress the wood has in it, the, the higher the likelihood for not having it go all cattywampus. So um, wood, can, wood can, can do all sorts of stuff. One of the tricks uh is to try and figure out is it moisture or is it stress in the lumber and you guys can look this up um if you if you get a piece of wood and you cut it down the middle you know say cut it this way you're exposing the innermost bits of the wood where it's going to be the wettest to 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 air if you cut it down the middle that way and let the two pieces sit for a day and nothing happens it was pretty dry if you cut it down the center and let it sit for a couple days and they go whoop, that's moisture leaving leaving the, the wood nine times out of ten. If you cut it down the center and it immediately starts to, to go crazy, that's stress in the wood. And that is a part of the milling operation of, of how that log was milled. Log. Um, so yeah, look up look up wood stress versus uh, uh, moisture. And it's, it's, for me, it's fascinating. For everybody else, it's like, it'll put you right to sleep. Yeah. Well, okay, it even puts me to sleep. But yeah. um, I think, and I could be wrong on this, but people send us wood from, from other states that are way more humid, and it gets here, and it starts to dry out, because mm -hmm. we're in a very arid climate, and it cups and goes all sorts of ways, yeah. almost, almost overnight. Um, Especially like the eight quarter stuff, because the outside dries. Yeah, but the inside at a different yeah, rate than yeah. the inside. So I think yeah. I think really it's it's almost always about moisture content and the wood drying out yeah. rather than the other way. Like yeah. I bet you we could send those boards back and they're not gonna they're not gonna straighten out. No, they're you they're have not to gonna. machine it. Yeah. to be flat again. Yep. So all right. Okay. Good. Uh, Andy the Saint wants hey. to know if uh, he says should I consider beer. For as a guitar making hand tool you know a, a lot of people think that all we do all day is sit around and drink i know andy is he's he's just he's, messing yeah, around yeah yeah but a lot of people think we sit around and drink all day and there was a time when we drank way more when it was just you and i working on guitars on the weekends yeah and people would come over it was just sort of a big party um and i remember i remember almost the day that you and i were like because it would happen, like 11 o'clock, we'd get started and we, oh, better crack a beer. Yeah, yeah, you and can't drink all day if you don't start before noon. Yeah, yeah. And, and it was fun, but there, was a, there came a time where we're like, we can't sit around drinking anymore. No. We We've could, got way too much stuff and we, we're making mistakes sometimes, so. Yeah, yeah, so, so we really don't. We drink, we'll, we'll uh, you know, at the end of the day, we'll have a couple beers. And then on Sunday, when we do the live thing, that's, you know, the whole point of that yeah. show is... is like, I'm not drinking right and, now. No, we're not. The, the, I'm really excited for the Thursday question and answer things, guys, because it gives us a chance to tell you guys, uh, you know, because what happens is, you know, the Sunday live things are fun, um, but we just kind of goof around and we have a little topics and we, you know, kind of interact with you guys and that's fun. But I know we miss questions. I know that it's like, hey, what do you think about stainless frets? And the guy will ask it and ask it and ask it. And we don't get to it. And, you know, and he's like, well, screw you guys. I'm going home. And the, the Thursday, Thursday Q&A things, I think, are going to be really helpful for, for people who have actual legit guitar questions. I hope that you guys like this format. So, yep. Uh... So guys, I've always wondered why you're called Texas Toast when you're not in Texas. Okay. Um, so I grew up in Texas. I'm an expatriated Texan, if you will. Uh, I wasn't born in Texas. I didn't even get there as soon as I could. Uh, but um, Texas is, is, it's a cool place and it's got a cool vibe. And I wanted something that was sort of had a cool Texas-y name because like, Stevie Ray Vaughan's from there, and Billy Gibbons is from there, and Buddy Holly's from there, and like, there's lots of cool guitar, musician, cool people who are from Texas, 
and the Alamo is in Texas, and there's that kind of rebellious like attitude that you get with Texas. And if you ask someone in Australia what Texas looks like, they might have an idea. They could pick it out on a map, but they wouldn't necessarily know what, I don't know, uh, Ohio looks like. I'm not, I'm not picking on Ohio. I know that for some reason I always do seem to default to Ohio. But Doug, I'm not picking on Ohio. I, 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 I apologize if it sounds like I am. But people all over the world have a sense about Texas. So I wanted to have something that was um, uh, kind of Texas-y sounding. I also wanted to have something that was easy to remember. I wanted to have something that wasn't my last name. It was easy to spell. Um, I wanted to have something that was all those things and Lone Star Guitars was already taken, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, oh, and Texas Toast is so dumb that no one else wants that to be their guitar name. So it was like, well, okay, it's easy. It's easy. It's kind of silly and it's fun and yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. Uh, how do I finish a neck with binding and a rosewood fretboard? Um, I have finished those with everything from oil to to lacquer, to polyester sealer, and urethane top coat. Um, the binding is really slick for um, um, oil finish necks. Um, it works great, and it's a really neat way. The, the very first uh, Les Paul style guitars that I made were, um, they were hard finish on the top, but they were oil finish, oil and wax on the back. Um, so, and that was a cool thing because the binding was a great no man's land where the, 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 the hard finish could stop and the oil finish could, could start. And you could, if they, if they commingled on the binding, that, that wasn't too bad. So, um, all those things work, uh, work especially well. I hope that answers the question for that. Yeah. One. So, um, if, if you're doing hard finish, you would do like this you'd leave the the fret you'd mask the fretboard mm. and spray your finish but it would go over the binding you don't mask the binding yeah i've seen people do that before but you don't and then you when you strip off the tape then you probably are going to end up having to do a little bit of fret work and clean up the fret ends because they'll have a little bit of paint on them but that's just the way that, that you do it yeah I, I guess i guess i missed the point of that question okay. because yeah i think that the, the thing to do is let the rosewood sort of be Mm -hmm. But everywhere else, go ahead and go yeah. ahead and spray finish. Yep, yep. And then if yep. you get any paint on the rosewood, you can just scrape it off with a razor blade. Mm-hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's cool, dude. I'm going to take this opportunity to tell you guys once again about some of the classes that we have that we offer online. Um, you know, COVID's kind of kind of throwing a wrench in some gears, and we get it. Um, it's a bummer. We don't like it any more than you guys do. But if you're having trouble, you know. Uh, looking for, for you know finding something fun to do and you, you you really want to come out here or if it's just too far to come we have a bunch of online archived classes and they're on the website texastoastguitars.com under classes there's an online section and the complete catalog of archived classes is available for purchase some of them even include discount codes for example the template one that we did earlier this month includes a discount code from guitar building guitar building templates.com 20% off that's good through the rest of the year. So if you wanted to buy some guitar building templates anyway, and you wanted to figure out how to use them, or you just wanted to listen to me and Chris talk for two and a half hours, um, that class is almost free if you buy some templates, basically. If, you know what I mean? If you, you get how I, my logic there, you can save enough money that you get the class for nothing. Um, so all those, all those classes are available on our website. Check them out, you guys. That would be super, super cool. On with the show. On with the show. Why doesn't every electric guitar come with a treble bleed circuit? I don't know. Why Why do you think? Uh, because not everybody likes treble bleed circuits. I don't actually like them. I, no, I, tone controls for me are, are kind of a, meh, I don't, I don't really care if they have it. I like I volume and that's all I need. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, the, the other thing is like why, you know, it's sort of like why doesn't all cereal come in a Ziploc bag? You know what I mean? And yeah. probably, probably cost is all I can think of. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, on volume, I, I play all the way up or just a tick back, mm -hmm. like nine, if I'm playing. And you rhythm adjust guitar volume at the instead amp. Of, well, yeah, or, or I play lighter or I play. Yeah, I'm not, I don't roll it down to four or five where, where yeah. you would notice a lot with a treble. 
Um, and, and actually, I like the way the, the volume pot changes the tone mm, okay. a little bit when you roll it down just a tick. I don't want that same all the way up, just less loud oh, okay. sound at that point. So, And I know other people are that way too. But I do know people that love treble bleed circuits. The cool thing about a treble bleed is they're fairly easy to install. Yeah, they're easy to install. They're, yeah, and you can try it out. So and, all of your guitars can have a treble bleed with, yeah. where for not very much money, and, and, and you can get that. Yep. All right. I don't know why they don't come from the factory. But anyway. uh, Bert wants to know, besides the spray gun, what all do I need to buy to get started spraying? Well, you'll need an air compressor. Mm -hmm. You need some way to throw air at the gun. You'll need a hose. Yep. Um, you'll need some way to regulate the air pressure. It's not a bad idea to have some sort of water and or oil collection. Yeah. But, and, but I would yeah. say that you don't necessarily need that immediately. You know what I mean? But they're not they're not exactly super expensive. So you need a, a yeah. you need a compressor, you need water separator, oil separator, hose, regulator, gun. Yep. And paint. Yep. <laughs> and, a, and a not breezy day outside. Yeah. Yeah. You do not yeah, you don't need a spray booth. No. Um and depending on what you're what you're spraying, sometimes you may not want a spray booth. Huh, Chris? Correct. Like if you're shooting a lot of flake. Let's just say you're shooting metal eh, flake. Yeah, whatever. Let's say you're making a video. <laughs> <laughs> metal flake is the herpes of the paint world. It never, ever, ever goes away. Yep. What else we got? Um. Uh oh. This sorry, is that, sorry. This is that part I hate. Um, so anytime there's dead air, guys, I want to. Yeah. I want to thank our sponsors once again. I want to thank Flipside Music, the great American guitar store. Mike Learn Airbrush, Mike Learn Guitars. Check them out. Mike is our very good friend. Bitterroot Guitars. And remember, you can save 15% at checkout if you use uh, code TXTOAST at checkout. I'd like to thank Simtech Coatings. And um, uh, I'd also like to thank our good buddies at Guitarwood Experts. Check all of our sponsors out. And if you would have any interest in becoming a sponsor yourself, please. Let me know. Sponsorships are available at popular prices. There you go. Okay. Uh, Driddle wants to know, why don't you see cherry used in guitar building more often? I don't know. I think it's just, I, I think cherry makes a really cool uh, guitar. Um, Is it a little weighty? Yeah, it might be a little on the heavy That's side. That's usually one of the reasons that woods aren't used. Yeah. Weighty or expensive. Or, it's, or just, it's not expensive enough. Or Yeah, or it's just not a traditional guitar wood. Yeah, yeah. You know, I did a video many, many years ago about using guitar wood uh, and, or using the, the kinds of woods that you should, you should kind of gravitate towards. Um, and and that if you want to sell guitars, and those woods are the ones that you guys know, mahogany, maple, ash, alder, um, Rosewood, ebony, and that's pretty much it. Um, if you start to steer too far into that, you get into that hippie wood territory, which is cool, but um, it's not, you know what I mean? Guitar players are very traditional. So stepping outside of, of the, um, the realm of, uh, of guitar, the classic guitar building woods, can be uh, can be a uh, a hard pill for a guitar player to swallow. So if you if you use the classic stuff, then yeah, it's you, remember the Gibson had those guitars, the the Smartwood series. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they had Cherry was one of their woods, but they were so wildly popular that I don't think they make them anymore. They were neat. They were cool, cool guitars, and they were supposed to be like sustainable woods and things like that. But I think they just sort of fell on deaf ears. Um, poplar is another one of those woods that like, I, it, it's great to, to work with, but people hear that it's poplar and they're like, eh, I don't know. And if you say, uh, this guitar is white limba. Oh, what's that? And you go, I mean, Karina, <laughs> Karina is not a thing guys. If you go to your local hardwood shop and ask for white limba, they may have it. If you ask for Karina, they'll look at you like, unless they happen to be guitar guitar players or builders themselves. I always wondered why they did that. I don't, I and still I think don't it, it know. It must yeah. be just so that they'd have the exclusive on that. Maybe they thought they could, they could fool people long enough that 
it, it, you know, yeah. would become a thing, and they'd be the only people that knew even where to buy Carina. Well, you know, the funny thing is Gibson's tried some stuff not unlike that, like the gold top Les Pauls. I, I want to say they were gold so that people didn't know they were maple. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, that might be an urban, urban yeah, myth, yeah. but yeah. We got any other questions? Uh, when clear coating a neck, how do you avoid the tape edge at the fretboard, unfinished fretboard? So like we were talking mm. about before. Uh, you sort of have to just scrape it back a little bit because, you know, paint lays flat except for the, the edge and then it sort of rolls up. So if you can just get rid of that, um, it'll, it'll be fine. You can scrape it down a little bit. Yeah, you need to blend it, blend it in. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um... Uh, did, can you use Santine Bloodwood or Purple Heart in a laminated guitar neck? You absolutely can. Is that Andrew St. Pierre asking? No. Uh, Andrew St. Pierre will be using um, Purple Heart on the, uh, the, the multi-laminate neck that we're going to be working with him on first week of December. Um, because that is just, it, it's, uh, Purple Heart's a cool, cool wood. Um, yeah, you absolutely can. Uh, the, the, the downside to a lot of those woods that are, are real color colorful like that is one they don't necessarily stay colorful for long uh, especially when exposed to uv bloodwood in particular starts out really cool red and turns brown fast um, uh, purple heart turns fairly fairly can be fairly quickly turned to brown um, the other thing is it can be real oily and so like paduke for example has that cool orange color and it gets everywhere. So if you, you know, have a multi lamb neck and you're like, well, I think I like maple and Paduke and maple and Paduke and maple sandwich, and you go to sanding it, that Paduke can like migrate into the fibers of the maple and kind of, kind of dick up your your um, uh, your your color scheme if you're not careful. So, so yeah, you can, and yeah, I do, yeah, I have, um, but. Um, it's it's uh, work work with it a little bit and see those are neat neat woods so yeah yep well it's been an hour it's been an hour guys so I would like to thank everybody for joining us this has been a lot of fun um, remember this is a this is a thing that we're gonna do every Thursday five o'clock Mountain Time um, except the first Thursday of every month because we've got online training uh, once again the online training schedule is uh, November fifth is the next one it's um, fret work. And uh, December 17th is, we're calling it In the Weeds with Guitar Necks. Uh, it actually comes with this neck blank. And uh, you will press in frets and, uh, and profile the neck along with Chris and myself. And we're going to be using hand tools for all of that. So if you guys want to uh, get in on that action, that is going to be a really fun online class. But other than that, guys, we're going to be doing this every Thursday at 5 answering your guitar questions, not getting drunk. We're still going to do that. that that's the question that uh, I think people have is, well, what are you guys going to do on Sunday? We're still going to do all the funny, goofy stuff that we do on Sunday, and that is going to be wildly fun still. But I wanted to do something like this where we could answer guitar building questions that maybe we can answer if you guys have some questions that you're like, hey, this is kind of kind of giving me the business. I want, I want to know more about this one particular thing. And uh, I wanted to give you guys uh, an opportunity to do that. Um, so is that, is that we got anything else? We got time uh, for one more? Yeah, we got time for a couple more. Okay. Uh, Andy Mandiak wants to know hey, what Andy. kind of nut uh, slotting files do we use? I use the Stumac uh, nut files that have two different size uh, gauge of strings on them. They're, they're a little bit more, but they, are, they work great. And they also work well for um, uh, trimming back and uh, filing the fret slot. Yeah, I use those too. Um, if I'm making a, a string guide where I need a longer slot, I have a set of uh, like like Hoshin or something like that. Not, oh yeah, not, because they're they're not, they're yeah. straight, right? They yeah, don't, they're they straight. They're the same thickness all the way through, yeah. um, and I'll use those. But otherwise, I just use the Stumac ones. I've gotten used to those, mm -hmm. and I like those a lot. And and it's another one of those things where you you look at it and it's like they're expensive, but. I would bet if you got them and you didn't lose them, you'd have them forever. Yep. You would never need to buy another nut. You will never file. be dissatisfied with those those tools. Yeah, and I've had some cheaper ones that were not very good, and it's worth and it's it's nice knowing that you got the best. Yep. 
You wanted the best. You You've got, the, got best. the best. You wanted the best. You, you got, got kiss. kiss. You'll, you'll. I don't. I'm not sure that the Stu Mac files are the best, but you will yeah. never be disappointed by getting the best. They're awfully good. They're, they're, they're damn good. Yeah, we've made hundreds and hundreds of, of, of cuts with them. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's go ahead and round it up. You got another one that we. Nope, looks good. Um, yeah, because we're we're gonna do this every week, so we can uh, answer questions next week. Yeah, so we'll see you guys. Uh, we'll see you on Sunday for like mad music and crazy comedy, just like Dr. Demento. Uh, we're gonna have drinking beers. We're gonna talk about Eddie Van Halen. We're gonna talk about lots and lots and lots of fun stuff. And uh, next Thursday, uh, we will be back at it in the uh, in the shop, talking, answering your questions. So until then, this is Matt at Texas Toast reminding you that if you're so smart. Build it yourself. That's what I do. Thanks for watching, you guys. We'll see you. Thanks, everybody.